John claimed that he became fed up with other men calling at the house when he was out, the implication being that Sharon possessed loose moral values, which was and is utterly untrue. Indeed, he said that one evening he became so incensed when a male acquaintance phoned Sharon from the Belfry Golf Club lounge that he leapt into his car and drove off to confront him. But according to John, when he arrived at the golf club and called out the man's name, he was told, most inconveniently for him, that the chap had left. To embroider this story even further, John told me in correspondence that the man turned up at the house the following evening, and a row between them ensued in the street. No blows were exchanged, but John says that he had done enough to demonstrate that, as he put it, I was the master of the house, so Sharon could not have her cake and eat it too. Yeah, John, you tell her. Except that you didn't have a car at the time because you had just lost your job, and you have never played golf, not even pitch and putt at a fair. Moreover, you were potless as well. Indeed, during my research for Lady Killer, I discovered that he never had a row outside of the house or any house at all. It's a cock and bull story, a pure invention, one which is further supported in that while he was brave enough to kidnap, rape, rob, and kill helpless women, this gutless loser would never have faced up to a man. He was too keen to keep his teeth intact and protect his self-admiring, constantly mirror-groomed good looks to risk any of that stuff. In one of his letters written from prison, Cannon talked of his strong desire to keep the family together because he claimed to be a family man. I rather think that Mrs. June Cannon might well disagree with this simply because her devoted husband was out and about most nights, half cut and trying to knock off anyone whose name began with Miss, Ms., or Mrs. I wanted to forge a more constructive future for us all, he claimed. But the odds were not running just like his finances, nor the two kiddies' bikes, in his favor. So he took a job with a car firm in Biddeford, Devon, which Sharon believed was in expectation of her moving to live near her parents in Ilfracombe. Indeed, John did spend some of his weekday nights with her parents, then commuted to Sutton Coldfield on weekends. Very occasionally he stayed with his mother in order to see his wife and daughter. Nevertheless, the financial implications of sustaining this complicated existence were crippling him. He was, in effect, trying to support two families while living apart from both at the same time. He described it as pressure with a capital P. Something had to give, and cracks began to widen in his relationship with Sharon. John says that he was besotted with Sharon because her maturity appealed to him. He was frank to me about his drinking, but he lied to her over his finances. She was, or seemed to be, the answer to a prayer he said, describing things when he first moved in with her in April 1980. But as his financial situation deteriorated, so his drinking accelerated. He claimed he was paying maintenance to June, a lie, supplementing Sharon's income when he was paying rent on a cottage in Devon in the hope of moving with Sharon and her children, a lie. 